What's up, B-Nation? You guys have a lot of questions about Antarctica, and we are here to answer them because we're getting the same ones over and over again, and I feel like you guys need to know. So we'll get right to it. The first question is, why did you guys go? Uh, we want to go to all seven continents. That's the goal of this channel and our personal goal. I've been all 50 states. She has not yet, but she'll get there eventually. And while we're still young, yeah, 47. we want to go to all seven continents. And the only way to get to Antarctica is either pay a bunch of money mm -hmm. or go work down there for five months. And it's so funny because most people who have this same goal of like working at, in, or not working, but going to all seven continents, Antarctica is always the very last one. For us, it was our fourth continent. <laughs> so like we're, it was literally the halfway mark for mm -hmm. us. So it's just really interesting that we were like, we don't have an apartment, we don't have any kids, we're not, you know, we have no, nothing holding us back right That's now from spending a lot of time down there. Because five months isn't just like, oh, five months, it's just, it'll go by so fast. I mean, it did, but you, most people who have regular jobs and, you know, like regular responsibilities that we do not have right now wouldn't be able just to like pack up their lives and go. So we were fortunate enough to have this opportunity to go while we don't have anything really going on. Another question was how can people sustain life down there? Well, field camps are not sustained. They disappear in the winter time, but Bermuda Station is always going, all year round. And so there's a desalinization water plant where they get their water from the ocean. There's like seven million gallons of oil that power all the cars and then as well as like eight different generators that power most of the station. And there is wind power on top of the hill that the New Zealand base gives us when they are done using it. So as far as normal life goes, it's able to sustain itself in Granite Station for like three years. If, no if nothing else could come down, it would still be there. How did you get your care packages? Oh, uh, so you could send mail down there. Basically mm -hmm. the way the mail service worked is we worked on a military base and so it would go through the military mailing network and hop from base to base until it got down to us. Yeah. If you sent a soft package, it would arrive in two to three weeks, but if you sent a hard box, I sent a hard box to myself from New Zealand, which is the origin point before you get to McMurdo Station, and it took four and a half months. But other people's <laughs> parents send them stuff from Pennsylvania, and it made it all the way to Antarctica in two weeks. Yeah. So it just depends on the size of the package and how all that Probably stuff Probably how heavy it is. Yeah. Yeah. Soft and there's, side, it definitely yeah. gets there faster. And there's priority equipment, like science equipment and submarines and things like that that obviously make it down very, That's very true. fast. But right. um, personal packages are, are not um, the Oof. quickest thing. But they can be. It just depends. Did you make a snow cone? <sighs> no. <laughs> uh, you ate some snow. I did eat some snow, but I didn't make a snow cone. I never, we have I never Frosty ate Boy, okay. Oh my gosh. We have, we have an better. ice cream machine on station, which is notorious for, um, I don't know. It's Breaking down. Do, do you, <laughs> we need 24 hours of ice cream for science, and I think the answer is yes. Sometimes there needs yes. to be a little bit of normality in your life, um, but that's what Frosty Boy is. Frosty Boy. <laughs> How did you get to go there? Oh, this is a big question. It's probably the one we got the most and in most of the comment section. So there are two ways, like we said before, you can pay a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. The smallest you can pay have. is $4,000 to don't get down there. That. And then the other option is to work down there. And there are several different countries that have these work jobs. A lot of them, you just have to be in the military. Like I know the Italians, most of them are in the military if you're not a science personnel. Mm -hmm. But for the United States, a lot of civilians get to go down there and you um, can apply if you Google Antarctica jobs, there'll be like 15 different jobs that pop up and you can apply to be a material handler. You can apply to be on the forklifts that work there. You can help with water sanitation, that's a big one. Um, or be a steward like us and work in the kitchen. Or if you're a chef, you can work in the kitchen. So there's a, there's a lot of jobs down there with a lot of different niches. So if you're really trying to go to Antarctica, the opportunity is there. You just have to apply and then spend your two to four months down there. Or five. Or five. Or six. Or 11. Or 14. <laughs> <laughs> but after 14 months, you do have to come back. Like, you can't live in Antarctica if you really wanted no. to, because there is a condition called... T3. Which it's like, it affects your brain. I think it's just from like, the monotony of the job that you have, and also that you are such, like, in an isolated... Your environment doesn't change. ...place in the world. Yeah. That you start to forget things. What? Which like is literally my day-to-day -day life. So I was like, I'm suffering from T3. <laughs> but if you, if you stay there for, I think 10 months is like the plateau, you uh, yeah. you really start to develop this and you're like, you walk into the same room that you have been and you're just like, oh, I forgot what I'm doing. 
I mean, right. unlike normal life where you can walk down a street and take a left or right and it could be a different experience, McBurno Station is very small. So most of those experiences happen in the first three months and then the rest of your 11, if you're staying for 14, mm -hmm. would be spent doing things that you've already done and so you kind of start to Just forget things. Over and over and over again. So you have to like go back to normal society, get the hustle and bustle <laughs> of like a city and then you're allowed to go back. Yeah. What is the average temperature there? That's a hard Cold. one. We were there in the summer, so a lot of you guys are probably thinking like negative 50 Fahrenheit, um, but that was not the case. It got down to negative 25 Regularly. when we first got there. Yeah. yeah. And then Which is still really, really cold, mm -hmm. but like I think people are thinking, wow, Antarctica is going to be ridiculously freezing, like below temperatures that the United States ever gets. Yeah. But at some points, not like Minnesota was colder than Antarctica because like I said, it was in the summer. We were there in the summer. Right, So their austral summer. Yes. The next question is, what was the Wi-Fi speed like? Oh, there is no Wi-Fi in the summer. <laughs> if you want to connect to the internet, you have to connect with an ethernet cord and mm -hmm. you can't connect your phone, it's just a computer. And the internet we did have was very slow. Very, very but we slow. were connected to the rest of the world, so I'd rather be slow and somewhat exist than just not be there at all. But if you stay in the winter, the population goes from 1,000 to 300, at which point the Wi-Fi does get turned on. There is Wi-Fi. How strong is the ice? Well, when the ice was existent, you could actually walk out on it. I mean, and I think in previous years it had been a lot stronger, um, and there was some questioning like, oh, are we going to let people walk out on it? Because they have this like trail that you can take from the U.S. base all the way around Observation Hill to the New Zealand base, and then you can walk back on land. And most years they're like, oh, it's super strong. You can just do, you know, you can just go on that hike when it opens. There's no question about it. But this year they were like, maybe we won't open it. But they ended up opening it, which is great. So we got to go on it. But this year it was about six feet thick, which is thinner than usual. And that's still, like, that's a lot of yeah. ice. That's not just like pond ice. Yeah. It's so thick. And so you can walk out on it until it breaks apart. At Zach Vanderberg, have you ever been to Russia? Ah, uh, we have not been to Russia yet. That's a weird question. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, we want to go to Russia. That is definitely on our list. We're trying to do all the way across Siberia from Moscow all the way to China. That's obviously a huge trek. As you guys know, it's a very far distance. It's the biggest country in the world. Um, that's on the list. It'll probably be not this year, but next year. This year we're trying to hit up Africa. Um, but after South America next year, we might look into Russia. How did you get to go to Antarctica and how could someone else go? We kind of already answered this. So if you get a, a job down there, they'll pay your weight. But if you are a billionaire, millionaire, or just really want to go to Antarctica for only a very short time and not commit a, like a good portion of your year there, then you can go on a cruise. And like we said before, they're, they are quite expensive. And most cruises are two-week cruises, and they leave out of Ushuaia, which is the bottom of the Earth. Antarctica's bottom of the Earth. But they're the bottom of the normal Earth on the bottom of South America, and you sail across the Drake Passage, and it's a two-day sailing um, excursion, and it, like it's the roughest seas in the world, so it's notorious for um, throwing you off. But once you get to Antarctica, then you can explore with zodiac boats and see penguins and seals. And we actually met someone who was working in Antarctica with us who did that. She had a mm -hmm. corporate nine to five job and she paid um, the money to go on one of these really cool excursions from Ushuaia all the way down to Antarctica and she fell in love with it. She said, I have to come back and I want to live there. And so she quit her nine to five job, packed up all her stuff, put it in the storage, and now is working in Antarctica. I mean, it's truly an amazing place, unlike any other place you've ever been. Did you like it? <laughs> we loved it. Of course we loved it. I mean, it's like, it is literally unlike anywhere in the entire world with the environment, but also socially. So you are completely cut off from the internet most of the time. Like you don't have Wi-Fi on your phone. And if you do have internet at all on your laptop, it is very slow. So it just kind of gets frustrating and you kind of tend to give up. At least I did most of the time. Mm -hmm. So you're just, you're completely cut off. And instead of people looking at like, let's say we're in the cafeteria and we're sitting down for a meal, people aren't looking at their phones. That'd be really weird. Like what's on your phone that you can't experience right here with me right now. All you have are pictures. <laughs> exactly. So you're literally forced to like, get out of your shell and talk to people, kind of like how you would 
before phones. 20 years ago. Right. I mean, 20 years we, just, ago. we just take it back and there's, I mean, imagine all the situations you're in now where you can just pull up your phone and it's basically the you phone erased boredom. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to do anything because you can listen to music, you play games, like you can look at Facebook, you can look at Instagram, you can look at Twitter, like you have dieting yeah. app, literally everything is just not there anymore. So you're stuck with talking to people and making relationships that would have otherwise not happened. And so it's yeah. just really unique because yes, it is a weird place, you're thinking like you're living in the middle of nowhere, on ice, and the environment's crazy, but also in the fact that the relationships you make aren't able to happen anywhere else in the world. So just these extreme experiences that wouldn't really happen with other people. You're able to get better relationships with those people, and I kind of miss the people in Antarctica. I do too. And I think I've become an extrovert because I went to Antarctica. Before we went down there, I was an introvert, and I was able to pull out my phone. Yeah, and well be it's so easy just to escape social. from yeah. the social interaction. Exactly, and then I got down there and I'm like, I need to meet more people like the people yeah. I met in Antarctica, but that's really hard to do. It really pushes your boundaries. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're like, oh, I'm feeling shy today. Let me just hang out in the corner and be on my phone or be on my laptop or just like, you know, close yourself off from any social interaction. Like it's very possible to do in the outside world. Mm -hmm. When you're there, you don't have that option. Yeah. Even if you're having a bad day, people are gonna talk to you. Exactly, all your meals are eaten in the cafeteria, like she said, most people have roommates. She was my roommate, and so like you're never by yourself ever. There's no car ride to your job, you walk there and see other people along the way. All activities are done with people, whether that's yoga class or working out, like there's always people around. And so you just basically become excited to see everybody. All thousand people, you know them on station and that's who you live with. So to answer the question, yes, we did love it. We changed a lot, I think, from the experience, which I guess that's what travel really is all about. Mm -hmm. When are you back in the United States? Um, we're coming back to the States in the end of March. Mm -hmm. And so after that, we don't know what's gonna happen, but we're pretty sure we're going to Eastern Europe in August before hopping over to Africa and doing an Africa trip for 30 to 45 days. We haven't decided yet. We were really excited to take you guys down there. The biggest question we have so far is do we take trains or buses? Because we know that you guys like to see the train travel and us mm -hmm. suffer through all the train travel. The buses <laughs> are so comfortable and they're air conditioned. So we really haven't decided that yet. But yeah. um, you know, if you guys have an opinion on what you want us to do, let us know now. Um, Cause that's the biggest question heading forward. What was the food like? That's a great question. We uh, get this question a lot. When we went down there, we thought we were going to eat military meals and just like canned beans every meal. I don't know what I was expecting, beans. but a lot of granola bars. And that is not the case. They actually have a full cafeteria because McMurdo Station is the base jumping point for not only American operations, a lot of seven other, other countries. international countries. Yeah. yeah. And so you get there and then you stay there. You could be stranded in McMurdo Station for up to two weeks because the weather is so bad. So mm -hmm. they have to be able to feed a lot of people. And then like we said in the summer, there is a permanent population of at least 800 and then the other, other fluctuates. And so you're feeding 800 people every day for three meals a day mm -hmm. and you need a big kitchen staff. And so they've I think that, got it. Yeah. Yeah, and the food was actually really good. Yeah, We're really surprised that you had probably three options every meal as far as hot food's concerned, mm -hmm. and you always had soup. Um, mm -hmm. There are about a dozen times that we get shipments of vegetables and fruits, and when that does come down, that probably lasts for four to five days on average, and so you have salad and yeah. oranges. Uh, yeah, get out of the whole like preserved food stage. Yeah, yeah, because the, yeah. the food that we do have, you know, like mm -hmm. some, day, some days we'll have like lobster or well, that was like, only on special occasions. Really, really nice <laughs> things, but those all the food that is down there came down at least a year ago on yeah. a cargo ship, and so it's been in the freezer. Mm -hmm. Yes, food is in a freezer, contrary to belief that you can just put food outside and it freezes in Antarctica. Like we told you guys, it gets up above freezing, and so that food would not be good if it was out there. So there's a gigantic freezer that's holding food for the entire year, and that is what we eat off of. What was your favorite meal? This is a question that I'm asking. Oh, my favorite meal the whole time? Mine was chicken piccata. Oh my gosh, so chicken good. Chicken piccata, what? Chicken piccata. They had this thing called pickle chicken, which is where they would <gasps> take all the pickle juice, because we ate a lot of pickles that were just in cans, and then they would marinate the chicken in them, and then bread them, and fry them. It tasted like Chick-fil-A. I got really excited. The pickle chicken. It just pickle didn't taste like chicken. anything else you had there, ever. Yeah. That was probably my favorite. So good. Thank you so much for giving us questions to answer on our time in Antarctica. We really did love it down there. I don't know if we'll be back anytime soon, but it was a very unique experience and we're happy to be able to answer all these questions that people had in the comment sections. Thank you so much for giving them to us. We had a really great time, I think. If, yeah, if you have any more questions, you should definitely ask them in the comment section below and we will answer them. 
And uh, hopefully, if you want to go down there, you've been helped. And if you have any more questions, like I said, just ask us and we'll let you know. At Zach Vanderbilt. I don't know. Why do they only ask you? Oh. Why did they ask me? I don't know. <laughs> you need to grow your Instagram.